Um, welcome everybody for our first Native Filmmaker Initiative Film Club of 2022. We are so excited to kick this off here this October with the film Joe Buffalo. Um, we have director Amar Shabib with us, Joe Buffalo himself and producer Haley Morin joining us as well as our Montana Office of Public Instructions, Mike Jetty to kind of tie in some pieces with our essential understandings here. And just an intro, my name is Julia Sherman. I'm the director of education here for the Institute and I work with Mike and a bunch of other teams to curate films every fall, a part of our Native Filmmaker Initiative. Um, this year we curated three documentary films that focus around indigenous stories are on the theme of self-discovery through sports. Um, so clearly we're gonna be talking about skateboarding today and we'll let Joe kind of guide us through that and that, that process and what it was like to have a film made about him. Um, and just a few things I wanted to make mention, we're based here out of Missoula, our film institute is, and the city of Missoula actually sits on Salish land and is in the Aboriginal territories of the Salish, Kootenai and Kalispell people. And Montana is actually home to 12 tribal nations and seven Indian reservations, each with its own culture, language, identity, uh, and history. I'm so confused. Like, I don't understand. It's on, so what? Nope, I'm gonna mute a, a classroom here. Okay. And here in Missoula, we're really uniquely elevated to highlight these indigenous voices. And we really hope that each day we can all strive a little bit more to acknowledge these stories, histories and expressions of indigenous people across North America, across the world and across Montana. And I was chatting with Joe on Monday and he did say, you know, it's indigenous people's day. It was on Monday, October um, 10th, but really we should all be taking time to acknowledge this every day of the year and celebrating these histories and really incorporating it into our day to day. Because I think as a, you know, as a culture and a history across North America, there's been some really um, atrocious, atrocious histories and the things that have happened to native peoples, you know, we owe it to our, to the communities and whatnot to be talking about this on the daily. And so we're so excited to have your classrooms in the chat. If you want to say what school you're coming from, what grade level you are, and feel free to make a land acknowledgement of your own. We'd love to see who's joining us here today to be talking. Um, I don't wanna take up too much more time, but I will start off. Um, oh, and just a little housekeeping. If you have a question, feel free to use the reaction button and raise your hand so we can make sure to unmute you and you can come up to the camera and ask your question yourself. If you're feeling a little shy, that's okay too. You can ask your questions in the chat and we'll make sure to get those questions answered in a kind of round robin approach. So be patient with us as we try to reach all the classrooms here and students, we are so excited to hear from you specifically. So we'll do our best to answer them in a timely fashion. And I know you're itching with questions and hopefully you've all seen the film already. If you haven't, no worries. You have until the end of the year to do so and to email us your questions. I'm sure Joe would be happy to answer them. Um, but just to kick off before we open up to classroom questions, I was curious, um, Amar and Joe, if you could talk a little bit about how you first met and how you decided, you know, this is a really collaborative film. Sometimes that can be hard to make. Um, you have to be really, there's a lot of trust involved there, especially within the documentary world. Can you talk a little bit about what made you decide to come together to make this film and kind of what was the impetus of it? Feel free, Amar or Joe, to take this one. Sure, Joe, do you wanna kick it off? Uh, you can. Okay. Um, uh, yeah, so uh, yeah, first of all, thanks so much for having us. Um, this is like a, yeah, just really excited to share the film with y'all and just chat a bit more about the making of it. So I first met Joe in Montreal back in 2005, I think it was, 2004, five, five. Um, So I came into filmmaking through skateboarding uh, as well. I think I was like 18 or 19 in 2005. And so I was just like a little skateboarder kid with a camera. And Joe was like this, like, you know, legendary skateboarder. And he was a lot younger at that time. And I was a lot younger. And we were just kind of filmed together. Why is this? Um, so, yeah, I, we kind of, we met, we skated a, to, with each other a bunch over, over the course of the summer. And then, and then, you know, I moved out West, we lost touch. I went to film school, the years passed. And then it was, um, it was in 2019 where I saw an article come out about 
about Joe and how he was turned pro for colonialism skateboards. And that's when I read about him being a residential school survivor for the first time because he didn't used to talk about it uh, as much back in the day. Um, so I was just kind of blown away by his story and, and I recognized him immediately. And then I just kind of looked him up and I saw that he was in Vancouver, which is where I live as well. And I was like, well, damn, like let's, I reached out to him and we met up for breakfast and we just kind of clicked, talked about the idea of making a film. And that's kind of, that was kind of the genesis for how it, it, it came about. And I was just inspired by him and his story. And, and I knew that it had a potential to kind of reach many different uh, audiences, particularly younger audiences as well through, through skateboarding. So I thought that was really, that was kind of cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, Joe, before I open it up to students, what was it like? I mean, this is a really emotional story. It's really personal. I'm sure it's really exhausting to have to rehash it and talk about it again and again. And you've done a lot of processing and healing yourself. Can you talk a little bit about what that process was like, you know, to have this film be made into something that's gonna go out into the world for everybody to watch? Well, yeah, for sure it was, took a lot of like courage, you know what I mean? And for me, trust was major because, you know, growing up in these institutions, there was a lot of, there was a lot of authority figures and there was a lot of people who were put in place to, to somewhat try to gain your trust, you know what I mean? And they weren't your friends and you know what I mean? So these are the closest thing to family that you have. They are indigenous, but they're not, you know what I mean? They're like childcare workers in a sense. So, and not only that, but having, yeah, like having uh, no access to a telephone to be able to like communicate with home and not being able to see your parents. It definitely affected me as I grew older because I've always just been one foot in, one foot out, one foot in, one foot out, no matter what it was I was doing in life, even in addiction, one foot in, one foot out. So, you know, which also like, that kind of just like flooded into like projects and stuff that I would never follow through in and stuff, you know what I mean? I was constantly not fault, like following up with a lot of stuff that I was doing in life. And so it made me very like skeptical of everything. You know what I mean? So to commit to anything took a lot of courage, not courage, but trust. And I didn't have it. So by having history with Amar, and of course that like I had been discovered as an actor and I had seen behind the scenes how directors would go above and beyond to get their shot and all morale would go out the window and you're just kind of like at this director's mercy. And so I've seen like, the slithery ways and kind of silly ways that that was kind of done but I was in my addiction as well so as I sobered up and Amara approached me I was like okay you're just some director trying to take my story you're like nah you know what I mean but I was kind of like I was kind of like oh it would have been that would be cool to kind of like you know what I mean so there was there was one foot in one foot out but then when he was like oh actually dude you know oh five you know what I mean? Like, I don't remember those years at all because it was, you know, that was just fully deep into my stuff that he had like totally just opened up this whole like, dude, remember? And my crew and all these people. About that. So he like jogged my memory, which in turn allowed for me to just be like, oh, dude, yours is like my bro, you know? So I immediately two feet in, you know what I mean? I'm like, I've never done this before. This is totally, I'm going somewhere I've never been. Do fit in, I trust you, you know? So I'm just, that was it. And I was just like, so as I slowly got to like, get to know myself, as I was, cause I was fresh into my sobriety, I slowly started to shed these layers that I was like, they were like proverbial band-aids that I would put over, oh, this happened in 1988. Well, I'll just put a band-aid on that and forget about it every happened, you know what I mean? And so as I slowly got to like, open up about my childhood and about, my past and stuff like that through the trust of having two feet in with this project it had just allowed for me to slowly start like opening up and, and like I could take deep breaths and I've had this strength that I didn't know I had and like all of a sudden obviously there was like moments of just like I, I would collapse or I like fully would just be like I need to get out of here you know what I mean and it it definitely was like a learning curve but at the same time I was two feet in, you know what I mean? And so fully, fully new to me. I had no idea like the outcome of what was going to happen. You know what I mean? And again, I 
very much to this day still have trust issues, but I mean, I'm working on that, you know what I mean? And so this is just an example of what, what happens when you actually put all your trust into something and you believe, you know what I mean? And so, yeah, I took, it took about, uh, yeah, it took a while to be able to like accept it that, you know what I mean? A lot of my friends who I was active in my addiction were like, man, I've seen you do some crazy things in life. But to be able to just share your life to the world, they're just like, you know what I mean? So to me, I'm just like, yay. But at the same time, I was just like, we did that? Like, what? You know what I mean? So it was like fully just like uh, purely just a gift, you know what I mean, of what happens when you actually are all in and you put your trust and you, it helps develop these things that you, you know, you're picking up pieces and little things that I picked up on my shelf that I put here back in the day that, oh, well, I did this and, and before you know, I got this stacked piece and with the vision of Amar and the eyes, you know, the, the cameraman, like the, the director of photography, Liam Mitchell, who I also have known for over 25 years, you know what I mean? It was just like, just a, just a bunch of creatives that just got together and through the, the ability to be able to trust, you know what I mean? It's like, it, it's, it was, it was major. And so, yeah, I'm really happy that we did have a history and that, you know what I mean? We were able to grow with that and build, you know, like never, not, not having footing, you know, like for so long and being one foot in one foot out, I've just been scattered, you know? And not, so yeah, it's been, uh, it's been a blessing, you know what I mean? Because to be able to now educate and use the story, you know what I mean? And how relevant it is today and what's going on in the world. And it's, it's amazing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for opening up about it and sharing it. I know our students here in Montana have been really moved by it. We've had a lot of really positive feedback from teachers and different students. And uh, I'd really actually love to open it up to students joining us here. If they have any questions for Joe or Amar, Haley or Mike, um, maybe get a raise, you can raise your hand or use the reaction icon if you have a question and would like to ask. We'll open it up there. I think I see D Feely's class. If student wants to, if you'd like to unmute yourself and ask your question, that'd be lovely. Or at least that's what you're, right. yeah, there it is. Yep. Okay, go ahead, Rudy. Um, and if you could say your name and ask your question, that would be great. Okay. Hi, um, I'm Rudy. Uh, I was wondering if you had any really close friends throughout your childhood. Or that's for Joe. Do I have any really close friends from my childhood? That would have to be, yeah, I do. I had pretty extensive friends growing up. A lot of them aren't with me anymore. There are a lot of them aren't with us. And so, yeah, I mean, I would have to go ahead and say like, there was a lot of my first cousins who were like my besties, you know what I mean? And also my second cousin, distant family, who I, to this day, you know what I mean? Like God, father and the whole godson, And you know what I mean? Very much they've named their they're first born after me and you know there's definitely I would have to say family was uh a lot of my best friends growing up because I have such a giant family <laughs> that's a great question all right uh Logan Ait's class I see a hand raised feel free to unmute yourself Um, what, um, what was it about skateboarding that you found so therapeutic? Very good question. Uh, well, you know, growing up, I very, very much was raised around competitive sports. I was very much a team player. You know what I mean? I had coaches. I went to summer hockey schools, you know what I mean? I very much was competitive. And so 
I, it made for, you know, like I, me not wanting to lose at all, you know what I mean? And so as I, as I like, cause you know, I, I started skateboarding like before I played hockey and so, and other sports that I, as I slowly got more and more into it, I realized that there was no two skateboarders alike with the same style push, none of that. There was no coaches there was no teams. So, you know what I mean? There was, there wasn't this pressure of having to perform or having to like impress someone or, you know what I mean? It was uh, very much just like an individual, individual, individualistic type approach. And for that, you can just like, as long as you've got your crew, like your, the people who you say, like my first cousins who I like, I, my besties who I skated with having them beside me, you know what I mean? And watching ourselves slowly become better than each other. And you know what I mean? Some people would put it down. Some people would just, they'd be up here and, you know, eventually it just like, it taught you like uh, persistence, you know, and, and being able to like, it's kind of like breaking a horse, they say, you know what I mean? Where if you get bucked off, well, if you're just going to be the one who got bucked off, you know what I mean? And you're never going to go back on that horse again. So for myself, it was very much just uh, wanting to just look like the people in the mag in the videos when I was a child, you know, like and how they. I just tried to emulate everything that they were doing, and so yeah, it very much is like, yeah, it was very much therapy because it's just uh, something that you just grow with as a child, and I remember the beginning. I remember just learning, you know what I mean? And learning my first kickflip on a gravel road, you know what I mean? And looking around and being like, no one saw that. I was like, how am I going to prove that I did this? You know what I mean? So I'd be like, yeah, yeah, check it out. And it was my 30th, you know, however many tries before I, someone got close to it. And they were just like, yeah, right. You know what I mean? So to not have anyone there to, with, like, to be able to celebrate, you know what I mean? These super like, to me, it was monumental. I like flipped them. Back then, they were 10 inch boards. There was no like eight and a half and stuff. You know what I mean? They were jumbo in the 80s. And so, yeah, very much, it was very much like therapy for like in that sense, you know? Whereas when you do, yeah, when you do are able to like, again, I like advocated for ramps on my reserve. So we didn't have roads. So I had ramps so that once I did go to like a city or a town and I'm like, oh, a ramp. And I do my thing. People were just like, oh, where did this kid come from? You know what I mean? And so yeah, that's a good question. It was very therapeutic in the sense that, you know, I watched all my friends become better than me. <laughs> you know, I brought it there and they all advanced. And I was just like, yes. That's a great question. I'm going to get a question in the chat and then we'll get another live question just so I spread the love a little bit. Um, Keely from Great Falls would like to know what competitions Joe's been involved in, which I'm sure is a long list. <laughs> um, well, in the beginning, there was no competitiveness to it again, you know what I mean? And that's what drew me to it. There was no, like if somebody got became better than the next, well, that was what you fed off of, you know what I mean? Regardless of what band they were from or what reserve they were from, you know what I mean? So by building these ramps, like I said, I advocated for them when I was 11. And so to be able to like have these, we had a 10 foot vert ramp, which is 30 feet wide and a six footer and a four footer. And so people would, I could see it from my house. So I'd see like a bus load show up and I'm like putting on my shoes and I'm racing over and it's like, where you guys from? They're like Lethbridge. And I'm like, that's like by the American border. I'm like, what? And so as people from far and wide would come just to come and skate and they were way more advanced than we were because we're just, we're, we're, this is all new to us. You know what I mean? I thought I was making up tricks. You know what I mean? I thought like, until I opened up a magazine, it was like, that's my trick. I'm like, what? You know what I mean? And so there was no real competitiveness and that's what, that's why I, I was so drawn to it, you know what I mean? Because again, being raised in organized sports, I was a rink rat. So you know what I mean? Like if my mom worked at 
she was the head of park and recreation. So you know what I mean? If no one was there to do the ice, I would drive that damn boat. You know what I mean? Like that's how into it I was. And so, yeah, it wasn't until like later as I moved off the reserve and moved out east to Ottawa, which is the eastern part of Canada, that I noticed that people were approaching me for sponsorship and also being on a team, which was, I was a little skeptical at first because I was like, ah, teams, you know, like whatever. But then it, once I realized that they were going to support you and what it is you were doing, and there wasn't that competitive nature just yet, then I was like, okay, well, I guess I'm part of this team. You know what I mean? So I was kind of just eased my way into it until I realized, oh, wow, there's like, I'm getting free stuff now. And on top of that, oh, there's a Montreal's two hours away. There's contests there. So I would just do what my thing, which is normal, just stuff I learned as I grew into skateboarding that I eventually just got the attention of others. And before you knew it, my sponsors are registering me into like World Cup circuit. So I was gaining points in a World Cup circuit. So it, I was so fortunate that without these sponsors, I probably would, I would have just stayed in Ottawa doing whatever I was doing, you know what I mean? And so it took some warming up into like feeling out the whole competitive side of it, you know what I mean? Because I was so just like, ah, I don't like, you know, just the competitive nature of it. So. Yeah, the World Cup circuit eventually just drew, that grew. And before you know it, you're making a name for yourself. People are reading magazines, which was like our form of, you know what I mean, exposure and coverage. You're like, whoa, you got a photo with Trotter? Like, wow, or like, you know what I mean? If you're like on the other side of the the other side of the country with a picture in say Halifax and you're opening it up in Vancouver, you're like, whoa, that's like that's what people were going for. So it was like yeah, it was it was different back then, you know, it was so 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 new and just everybody was just so inviting and so welcoming, you know. And so it made for me to be able to just kind of let my guard down. Or there's okay, there's a the shop owner, but it's not the coach, you know what I mean? And there's like teammates, but they're you know, they're on your side. And it's just like it was just really so new and so like weird, you <laughs> know, in, in a sense, you know. So I don't know if that answers your question. Great questions. Um, next question will go for Nara and Diamond's class. I see a hand raised. If you want to unmute yourself and ask, I see a student at the camera. How did you transition from residential schools to skating? I didn't. I had my, my skateboard with me in residential school. Like I said, I picked it up before I even went. So I had had a foundation already, for, which was those ramps. And you know what I mean? It wasn't until I moved off the reserve that those ramps got torched and everybody quit skating. And you know what I mean? I, I made sure every year that those ramps, because there was no roof over them and our winters are harsh up in Canada, that I was the one that would make sure that I would approach Park and Rec and say, resheat the ramps or you know what I mean? Fix them for us. And so I, was somewhat the glue that kept the scene alive that when I did go to residential school, I went there for sports. So you could steal my hockey gear because I, you know, it's, it'll be replaced. But what I had to go above and beyond for was to keep a lock specifically for an extra locker, specifically for my skateboard, because everybody wanted to try and steal that thing. You know what I mean? And so I've always been as much of a, a rink rat as I am a skate rat. You know what I mean? I, to this day, I still, sure, it's been almost 40 years of skating, but I'm very much that same, the same kid who learned my kick flip on the gravel road on three mile. You know what I mean? I'm pretty much the same. So transitioning was just my, transitioning was my, the environment. Having a transition from an constantly having authority figures determining your you know what I mean determining when you ate and when you were allowed out and when you were you know what I mean allowed to if you needed a phone call you were able to make one but it was only a, you know so having to like transition from 
dormitory living with bars on the windows to like big buildings and the buses and area code and like, wah, you know what I mean? Transitioning into a whole nother culture was just by far the biggest one for me because I very much had a chip on my shoulder and where I came from, if you weren't native, you were against me. And I'm fair, look at me, you know what I mean? So I got it from both sides, you know? I got it from my own people and I got it from non-natives. So it very much gave me identity issues, but at the same time, like, I got a glass eye, which you're staring at, you know what I mean? I was, I had that chip on my shoulder because of where I'd come from. And so having to like, let my guard down and transitioning into like, let's say, you know, society and the way of living, especially in the nation's capital. Like it was like in Ottawa, it was like, uh, that proved to be the, the, the biggest uh, challenge for me was just trusting and like making friends and even like, you know, finding, I was like, okay, I want to know who the bad kids are. So, you know, I was just trying to find out my crowd, you know, and my crew. And then once I realized that, whoa, you're the bad guys. Well, you come from a good home and you live in a big house and you come from privilege and like, what, you ain't so bad. You know what I mean? I'm like, eventually I found like the kids who actually came from, who were my, where I could relate to. And then they happened to be skateboarders. So I was just like, my people, you know? And so that kind of eased me. And they taught me like, look, you can't do this, man. That's fully against the law. And I'm like, what? You know, just, you know, it was just fully me just being myself. And they're like, so they were teaching me morale and value and what was right and what was wrong. You know what I mean? So I don't know if that answers your question. Great, great questions. Um, I'm going to get a question in the chat and then we'll get over to Cody Munson's class because they've been waiting. So Carolyn and Annika's class at Willard Alternative High School have, I'll kind of turn it into a two-part question. Their first question is, what's your favorite ledge trick and what advice you got? <laughs> Backside tail slides. <laughs> Just because you can do them absolutely anywhere. And not only that, but it's just such a stylish trick, you know? And so my advice, I mean, uh, yeah, good one. I would have to say, <laughs> I would have to say, yeah, I don't know, again, persistent, you know, like if you, not everything's going to come easy. You know, you got to put your time in no matter what it is, 10,000 hours, they say, you know, and so, you know, it could have been ballet. It could have been rodeo. It could have been figure skating. And I would have put my 10,000 hours in and just wanted to become the best at it, you know? And so you, you put your time in and eventually, you know, you're going to get, you're going to be the very best at it. And that's just uh, advice. I wish I would have got, I would have had when I was, 20, 25 years ago, you know, I wish I would have had someone who was my age, who had gone through what I had gone through so I could bounce things off them to figure out my voice, my stance, why I'm here, why is this and why is that, you know what I mean? And just to be able to have a better understanding of what was out there, you know what I mean? And so that's mainly, mainly part of the reasons why I'm, I'm doing what I'm doing now is to be able to teach indigenous youth that, you know, you do have a voice, you're not alone. And uh, yeah, good question. <laughs> Advice. Yeah. Yeah, these are some heavy hitters. All yeah. right, um, Cody Menson's class, you've had your hand up for a while. Do you want to unmute yourself? And please remember, say your name and what your question is. Hi, I'm Owen. I was just wondering, what is the number one thing you would like of you, uh, someone who watched this film to take away with, or to take away from it? Um, well, you know, well, you know, like the, the history books have been revised, you know, to uh, protect the government's dark colonial past. And so what we're doing and what this film, I'm hoping 
Amar and Haley agree with me on is that this is very much like, uh, it's a very much living and breathing like fabric of our society as well as yours. And so what we're doing is rewriting the history books and we're doing it, you know, not only is it compelling for myself, but also I'm hoping that I can inspire others to come forward to be able to tell their story. Cause you know, a lot of people get taken down by colonialism and you know, the, then yeah, everything that entails the word. And so, you know, just to be able to educate the public on what, what's really took place, you know what I mean? And uh, yeah, I can't, I can't take all the credit, you know, everybody here, everybody that was aboard on the film, everybody had the same vision, the same drive as myself, you know, I was just the subject in the story. And so with the team effort here, we're just hoping that you can share with others and, you know what I mean? Be able to like retell these stories because, you know, it'd be different if I was not alive and someone was telling my stories but I'm, I'm alive and I can still all your shopping cart. You know what I mean? So I'm very much, very much like, very much stoked to be able to share this on this level, you know, and to be able to, to, to be able to use such a, like a demograph, such a skateboarding that everybody can just attach themselves to, you know what I mean? And just say like, wow, <laughs> you know, like it's just like uh, back in the days you would, yeah, I used to run from, I used to get chased down and beaten up for what I thought was because I was indigenous, but it was because I was a skater too. So I was like, oh, another reason to just run, you know what I mean? I was like, which eventually just toughens you up. And then you just learn like how to stick up for yourself. And as a skateboarder, who's also indigenous, it's just like, a, it's like having a body armor, you know what I mean? And like I said, a glass eye. And so, yeah, be able to educate is super important in this day and age. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Great questions. Um, we have another heavy hitter from Lara. Lara Be Bellis's class in Cook City. And they were curious how you overcame the cards you were dealt with, as you say in the film, yet your father could not or did not. And how, do you how did you break that cycle? I'll, uh, it's an everyday thing, you know, from the second I wake up in the morning to, I, to when I go to bed, I have to come up with a whole new strategy and plan on how I'm going to get through my next day because, you know, I'm very much an addict still. I just don't do drugs, you know, I'm very much an alcoholic. I just don't drink alcohol. And so being like, being as close to the, to uh, the creator as I as I was growing up, and then being so distant through my addiction and and my alcoholism. Once I had reconnected, and you know what I mean, asked for everything that is now in front of me and everything that I have right now. You know what I mean? It's kind of like rubbing a genie's lamp and you're asking for that wish, but you do it through ceremony and you ask you ask for it deeply, you know, like how awesome would it be to just have your own one bedroom apartment, you know, or how awesome would it be to just be able to shake off these, you know what I mean? My dad's abuse that was instilled on me, he had gone through residential school and he had gotten it just as bad, but he didn't have the resources he chose not to like speak about such things, you know what I mean? So when you were suppress things as harsh as the way he was treated, because he was as north as you could possibly go, Northwest Territories, Anubik is my dad's Inuit, you know, he's Dagrib Dene. And so he he just took it out on his kids, you know what I mean? And he took it out on his wife and he took it out on you know, he became a boxer and you know what I mean? So he was just a very scary man where I should have just ran to him for birds and the bees and advice and stuff like that. Nah, I feared my dad. You know what I mean? And it was only because of the way he was treated. And that's even to this day, like my mom has gone for as many years as she has to residential school and she doesn't even, she's fluent in Cree. You think she would have taught me how to speak Cree, you know what I mean? But that's just how she was raised. She didn't. 
I had to figure it out on my own. And so the little things like that, where, you know, I would, I was mirroring this stuff, you know what I mean? My dad, when he had run away from six kids, that's just what he did in residential school. So that trickled out into life that if anything got rough, he'd take off. And so I did the exact same thing, you know what I mean? And so really it was just about like, uh, yeah, it's just having community and support, leaning on my elders for advice and digging into my culture and yeah. Um, the same class was curious what the meaning behind your right sleeve tattoo was. If you right, care to share. My which? Your right sleeve tattoo. Yeah, I this think one that's one. Uh, well, I have two skateboard trucks. <laughs> I got this in one sitting. And so, again, there was no real meaning because I just gave my friend my arm and said, draw something, you know what I mean? And so pretty much I wanted to have roots and vines because my life as a lily pad then was like, I wasn't up, I wasn't down. I was just kind of like, you know what I mean? I was just like, yeah. So there wasn't really any meaning other than it was fueled by drugs and alcohol. There was no real no real symbolism behind it other than two skateboard trucks with a bolt and an old school wheel with his bears exploding. <laughs> so I was just like, here's my arm, go for it. You know what I mean? And it wasn't really, now I have this arm, which is like fully, I get to pick and choose what goes on it. So it's kind of just, I just slap on symbolism where I've been. Like here I have like a, a Montreal logo I lived in Montreal for 10 years, you know? And so just like little things that I like, you know, kind of tells a story about where I've been or what I've done and yeah, stuff like that. So, I mean, yeah. Rad. Um, okay, Kristen Dejarla's class has been having their hand up for a while. If you want to unmute yourself, come up and ask your question. Thanks for your patience, guys. There's a lot of questions here. I'm trying to keep up with the chat and all the hands. We want to answer all your questions here and get enough time. These are great questions. So thanks for being patient with us. What was your hardest part of sobriety? Oh, deep question. What was the hardest part? Well, being able to drink ginger ale, I couldn't do that for the first few months because it would remind me of Ryan Ginger's and whiskey was my jam, you know what I mean? So that was very much a trigger to drinking ginger ale. And so also, you know, your environment, it plays a very big, huge role in how, what makes you tick, you know what I mean? And so, like I say, I speak on toxicity a lot, you know what I mean? It's not to say I'm not toxic. I wake up in the morning and I think toxic thoughts, you know, as quick as they're there, they're gone, you know what I mean? But your environment plays a huge role on whether or not, you know, you want to like stay on the path you're on or if you want to go down certain roads, you know what I mean? And so it took me a long time to realize that. And there was also acknowledging patterns that I knew I very well knew that if I were to turn this corner over here I knew what was around that corner but I was too scared to take that turn I had too scared to make that corner because of what I was you know what I mean I didn't want to acknowledge what was around that corner and I could be anything you know what I mean and for me it was the unresolved trauma childhood traumas you know what I mean the abuse from my father and just like again, a trust thing. So this is very much therapy for me. You know what I mean? To be able to just open up like this. I'm just like, it's been a minute since I've done one of these. And so, yeah, to be able to fill the void, which was once my addiction, to fill that void with this not-for-profit that I started where we empower Indigenous youth. So to be able to see the stoke and kids' faces light up when they do something they didn't think was achievable. Well, that just, I'm filling in that void of what my, what, 
what the emptiness where my addiction would have been you know what i mean i'd be filling that in with either the joys or the the trials and tribulations of just day-to-day -day life and so and also being able to like being able to grow you know what i mean i was always in a standstill i was always like like again too scared to take that corner i knew what was around that corner you know what i mean i just uh, didn't have the courage to and so yeah that's like my new addiction now is to be able to is to is being in control of my life and if i want to go on a trip somewhere if i you know what i mean to be able to to save and to build and to not only that but to put other people on and to be able to you know what i mean to this board company that i'm a part of called colonialism skateboards what we're doing is we're re-educating everybody on what really, really took place in canada you know what i mean and the world over and so for the longest time it had just been myself you know what i mean me and the owner and through board graphics and symbolism and telling the stories and this and that can be pretty exhausting. And I'm like 46, you know what I mean? I'm not getting any younger. So what I did in turn was I handpicked indigenous skateboarders here in Canada who I feel, you know, they come from a long lineage of, you know, long lineage of warriors and powerful people that I just felt like this would be the best way for them to honor their ancestors is by putting up, you know, so being able to in, include indigenous skateboarders to come on the path that I'm on. That's like, it's amazing. You know, it's like, uh, yeah, before you know, we're going to have a whole army of us <laughs> crushing it. <laughs> well, thanks for sharing that. And I'll answer another student question and then I was going to have Mike jump in here and give us a little context on that kind of federal policy piece that can kind of help put a little bit of this into frame for us. Um, but we had a question actually from Beth Barrett's class to Amar and Haley about how you guys were managed to get involved with Tony Hawk in this film. And maybe that also involved Joe. I'm sure it does. <laughs> um, yeah, so we'll he wasn't involved while we were making the film. Um, we we finished making the film and then and then uh, started screening at film festivals. And then I think it was Joe and I that were on a Q and A panel for the Cleveland International Film Festival. And there was uh, another uh, Canadian filmmaker named Ben Proudfoot who was there. And um, and uh, yeah, we just kind of connected. And he had. I mean, we didn't even know, I didn't, well, I didn't know this at the time, but he had an Oscar nominated film and we, but we just connected and we started chatting afterwards. And he basically was represented by WME, which is like a talent, a big talent agency that um, uh, Tony Hawk is also represented by. So he talked to his agent, agent talked to his agent, showed him the film, they loved it. And he's like, yeah, I want to come on board and support the film as an executive producer. So then he came on board Tony Hawk came on board um, afterwards when the, after the film was technically already on the festival circuit, but in time for us to release the film with the New Yorker and give it a good boost. Awesome. Great questions out there. Um, I want to kind of bounce this question over to Mike here and maybe he can give us a little more context and feel free to be as brief as you can, Mike, because we only have a little bit more time and we can get to a few more questions, but you know, I know here in the US, our federal government has only recently really come forward, come forward and acknowledged the immense impact of Indian residential schools here in the US, which is also hugely an issue in Canada. I mean, a lot of it was inspired by what was happening in the US and across North America. Um, can you touch on this a little bit and give a little bit of context to this kind of federal policy and how it in impacted Indigenous peoples? I realize that's a big question. Maybe you could just kind of tell us the significance of this acknowledgement and where we're at today with it. Sure. Um, to me, you know, there's been a lot of, uh, you know, painful, tragic history, you know, that's happened to Indigenous peoples, you know, not just here in the Americas, but worldwide. But I think, you know, the, the power of Joel's story fits in with what we do here in Montana to talk about Indigenous perspectives and, and share some of these, you know, real stories as opposed to what you might read in a book or something, um, but to hear directly from someone's experience. But then that power of, uh, you know, resilience and healing. And I think that's one of the messages I like that I'm hearing from Native communities is, 
reconnecting with culture, tradition, spirituality, and, uh, you know, healing up from this. But it's, it's a two-way street, too. Like, I know that the Catholic Church, you know, the Pope was just up there in Canada, you know, apologizing for boarding schools. And that's that's a great first step. But hopefully there's more beyond that acknowledgement. But I think, um, you know, hearing these stories, hearing Joel's story and the filmmakers, thank you, Haley and Amar, for making this film. So students across Montana and, and you know, all across the U.S. can get a, get another perspective. And so I think that's the power of these films. Um, and so, you know, just sharing a different perspective on our country's history, where we've been, where we are, and how we can move forward together. And I think that's one of the goals of Indian Act for All. And these, these powerful stories from Indian country, I think, can help broaden our understanding of these issues. So, um, and it's all about relationships. And I've heard that, you know, in the themes you guys have been talking about making connections with either people or, or something you're passionate about. And so, you know, that's the power of those relationships. And then just seeing everybody from these classrooms in Montana, I thank you, you know, for, uh, you know, opening up your hearts and minds to indigenous issues. And for those teachers out there, thank you for sharing this film with your students and having those discussions in the classroom. And I'm glad that you're all here because your mission, what we're doing today fits with Indian Ed for All. And so, um, just thank you for doing that. Thanks, you know, Julie and Joe for providing this platform here and sharing. So thank you. But um, that's the quick 30 second answer or two minute answer there. So we can Thanks, all follow Mike. up more teachers in Montana. If you want to know more, feel free to reach out. So definitely. Yeah, Mike's a great resource. Um, OPI has been amazing to work with. Um, we can answer about two more student questions here before we finish up. I want to get to Christine's class in Hinsdale. Um, Reese in her class was curious if you felt, and this kind of was addressed in the film, but did you feel that the residential school was haunted? And if you could talk a little bit more about that, Joe. One hundred percent. Yes. Uh, you have to remember this is like a child's jail. This is a kid's jail. So you know, there would have been generations and generations that had gone to school there and I'm not going to get into too much detail, but yeah, it's very much haunted, meaning that there's some spirits in there that want out. And in our culture, there's a way of dealing with the loss of a young one and they're not able to follow through with this protocol in the way that they're supposed to be sent back to the spirit world. And so, yeah, they're stuck spirits in these institutions where you, you I could have conversations with them. You know what I mean? I could very much hear them. And it would be almost, yeah, I, it would be very much like someone was sitting right beside you, talking to you, whispering to you, or babies crying. That was a common one. Because, you know, a lot of these priests would, uh, you know what I mean? They would either have non-consensual sex with either the nurses or the, the, the sisters or the students, which would in turn get pregnant. Well, they didn't want anyone knowing about that. So there was very much, people were being buried in the walls. So it was every day you'd hear things. And I remember the first three months of being in school, I couldn't fall asleep. And so I would just, uh, I'd ask my CCW who had gone to the same school as me and he's sleeping in the, in the room over. And I'm like, yo, what's this? You know what I mean? I'm going nuts here. And he's just like, oh yeah. And he told me it's going to take a couple of weeks, you know, whatever. A couple of weeks was like months. And before you knew it, he would just drown it out with either prayer or whatever have you. So 100% was haunted. 
with lost spirits. Um, thanks for answering that. I know this is hard to bring back up and these aren't difficult. It's just the truth when, you know, it's, uh, it's just the truth. That's all. Yeah. We have time for two more questions. And then Joe, if you don't mind, I have a bunch more questions from students. Maybe I could email them to you and you can answer them and I can send those to those students and those teachers to get those answered. Unfortunately, we have run over time here, um, but we can take a question from Cody Munson's class if you wanna unmute yourself and then one from Kristen's class. Um, and then I think we'll close out after that. So Cody's class, if you wanna unmute yourself. Okay. Uh, um, Name. Elsa is my name and um, I have a question for the director and my question is uh, would you change anything about the film if you got a chance no uh, wish I could have swore more no I'm just kidding <laughs> no <laughs> no yeah. we, it's pretty, pretty accurate <laughs> yeah yeah, we give them a censored version, I think. So, yeah. <laughs> um, no, I was, I'm, I'm, I'm really grateful for how for it turned out. And we, uh, you know, we really took our time with it. You know, we shot like 13 and a half days, which is a lot for a short film. Um, and, you know, we didn't really, it took, I don't know, started in 20 and October 2019, and then it wasn't really released until uh, early 2021. It started going to festivals, and so we really took our time with it to uh, make something that we were all felt really strongly about, especially just how you know how important we thought the, the work would be. We just wanted to make sure we were happy with it. So, a good question. Yeah, great question. Um, and then Haley, I know we haven't had you say too much on this call, but thanks so much for being here. You know, you're the producer of the film and that's huge in getting a film like this made and done and you're from Canada and you're also indigenous. Like there's a lot of things there we haven't even touched on in this. There's just been so many questions. Um, is there anything about making this film for you that has been really, you know, what about this project felt different for you and how did you get involved in the first place? Yeah, I didn't, I couldn't remember if I could even like speak at this point. <laughs> I've heard my voice in so long, um, but that's okay. Um, I really take that opportunity. I think it's sort of a perfect example of just what a producer does for a lot of their films, especially in the documentary space where I really just feel privileged to be a support in getting people's stories out like Joe or allowing to sort of take a back seat for someone like him to really speak to his experiences. And I got brought onto the project about halfway through filming. So I really was just sort of thrown into it um, in the middle of, and I was extremely grateful to be able to hold space with um, the filmmakers and, and Joe and all of that to be able to bring this film to the public and to have sort of this great um, reception that we've been able to have and to do things like this, to speak to students and youth. Um, that's definitely nothing that I was able to have growing up. I didn't really even see people who looked like me in my school because I did go to, you know, private, predominantly Caucasian schools. So to have people like Joe and even, you know, myself be able to come into these spaces and put a face to these experiences. It, it's a, been a very rewarding experience and, and a huge blessing. Well, thanks so much. And without producers, a lot of these projects don't get made. And so your, you know, contributions are hugely valuable. <laughs> yeah, Haley this produced all of our stuff in Alberta, all the stuff you see, like, like with the buffalo and 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 skateboarding in, Al in Alberta, basically, um, Haley produced that, and she brought us onto uh, into her community, Enoch Cree Nation, and kind of we were able to film with like the young Joe, like the young Joe in the skate park, learning the ollie and stuff. Like that was all there. So yeah, and it really it speaks to also just who Joe is as a person because I remember calling my friend. Um, Cody, who's who's an actor as well, who has known Joe for a long time, and he was working at our youth center out here where we actually just, we opened a skate park about 
a year before the film was being made and I called them and I said, hey, you know, we want to get some kids shots and, you know, do, do they have their boards? Are they able to? And he's like, Joe is my boy. Like, of course, like come out and all this stuff. So um, it's really also just shown the, the kinship that this film has brought and, you know, reconnecting a lot of people. Mm -hmm. I, think, I think that's actually a really nice note to end on. And Kristen's class, I'm sorry we didn't get to your question. I would love if you could write it down and email it to me. I put my email in the chat. Um, I have a ton of questions here. So really no, not too many questions. I'm sure, I don't mean to speak for Joe, but I'm sure he'd be happy to answer them um, via email and get them back to us. Um, thank you guys so much for being here. This is an incredible opportunity. It's incredible for Joe to be here to share it with our Montana students. You guys have been awesome. The questions have been great as always. We are so excited to share this kind of work and really remind you, you know, having Amar and Haley here, as well as Joe, how collaborative this is. One thing that's crucial in documentary film is sharing stories and talking about it. It involves a lot of people and it's all about working together. And that's one thing we try to highlight here at Big Sky Film Institute is that, you know, this is not just about one person doing one thing. It's about learning to work with people and that collaborative nature and really making space to listen. So thank you guys so much for being here being really great listeners and asking such great questions. Um, we do have, this is the first film in our series of three. Um, our November film is The Trails Before Us and it's about a young Diné mountain biker. Um, and he, they will be joining us November, I believe it is November 9th we're do, at one o'clock PM mountain time. We'll send out a survey for you guys for this film club to see what you learned and any feedback and questions. And we'd love you guys to register for film clubs for November and December. Um, Amar, Joe, Haley, is there anything you'd like to add before we go? No, well, thank you guys so much. And Mike, thank you as always. We really appreciate you taking the time and for everyone here being so patient with us. It's such an exceptional opportunity. Um, I wonder if you could all give a big wave so Joe can see you. Um, we really appreciate him taking his time and Haley and Amar and Mike. It's been such an honor and a pleasure. It's all ours. <laughs> and if anybody wants to follow up with any comments or questions, um, if you love the film, you know, any, anything like that, we want to hear it and we're really open and we are always trying to work on this program and make it more accessible. So thank you so much. Lee, um... I just wanted to plug uh, my not-for-profit, Nation Skate Youth. Uh, we're on Instagram. We have a website called nationskateyouth.com. Uh, you guys keep up to date with a lot of the, a lot of the trips and a lot of the stuff that we have planned in the upcoming seasons. And uh, yeah, thank you. Thanks again, everyone. Awesome. Thanks so much. And you mentioned that that chief pen maker skateboard is out of stock right now, but I'm sure people are curious about where to get it and when they can. I mean, it's out of stock in Canada, but I mean, they're uh, really, it's up to me on whether or not we could do a reissue. So yeah, if there's a, if there's a huge, huge enough demand, then maybe we can do a reissue, who knows? Great, I know we got a lot of skater kids in the audience, so that's good to know. Awesome, thanks you guys. Really take care, enjoy the rest of your day and hopefully we'll see you in November. Awesome.